across the globe by satellite. Join us for Welcome to Grace, where we'll discover together the distinctiveness of Paul's apostleship through the rightly divided word of truth. Now, join pastor and Bible teacher, Kirk Christ, as we explore the unsearchable riches of Christ. Return in today's lesson to our short study of Paul's letter to the saints at Colossae. Uh, and hopefully you recall that Colossians is the letter where Paul is correcting the thinking of believers where agape love is concerned. He's straightening, straightening their thinking out as to what agape is. And as I said in a previous lesson, he's doing so from the standpoint of man's agape toward God and also from the standpoint of man's agape where man is concerned, fellow man. So it's man to man, man to God. He's cor correcting the issue on both sides so that people know what it means to agape God and what it means to agape your fellow believers. Uh, our apostle wants us to see how agape love operates and understand that this type of love uh, is about something different than the other three types of love. Lest we mistakenly assume that agape love isn't any different from, let's say, phileo love. And, uh, and, and tie the idea of something given with the ex expectation of something returned attached to it. Uh, reciprocation, as I call it. Reciprocity. You do this for me, I'll do that for you, and we'll be great friends as long as we have this connection of doing for each other. If you are kindly disposed toward me, is the idea behind phileo, I'll be kindly minded uh, toward you. Uh, but friendship love, or mutual affection love, as it's been called, uh, that can go sour, as we all know. Uh, and it does so oftentimes. The reason for that is because phileo love is emotionally oriented. There's emotion involved with phileo love, your deep friendships. You feel that sense of, 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 uh, of a connection and emotion is tied to it. The same is true of eros love, as I think everybody here knows. God designed the chemistry that's associated with, uh, with eros love, the hot flames we might say of erotic, uh, passionate love to wane naturally over a short period of time, actually I think most scholars say about two years, after which a much slower burning love is to kick in, but then again, that slower burning love after agape between husbands and wives, so to speak, requires the interaction of both marriage partners. One, It's not one alone. It's, it takes two to make a good marriage. Uh, and every marriage counselor will tell you that good marriages require dedication. They require hard work on the part of both of the marriage participants. So something is expected even in the love that remains after Eros love with husbands and wives. And that's that communication channel, staying open uh, and, and both people working at the marriage. It's just difficult to get away from the idea of reciprocation, reciprocity. Uh, I'll do this if you'll do that idea. The, that was what the law program was all about with Israel. Even storge love, called storgos, uh, one's the noun, one's the verb, um, uh, that's emotionally driven love as well. Um, when it comes to that close blood connection bond that you have with children, uh, you can see that reciprocity is involved uh, when, when parents mistreat children, when children mistreat parents, the love may still be there, but can she, you can see a total disconnect. So family feuds by the way, can be some of the most serious, some of the most intense uh, and anger-related battles to be found. Uh, the same can be true when it comes to, to feuding spouses, as I said a moment ago. How quickly anger and resentment rear their ugly heads when things don't go our way. Uh, and there's a reason for that. We'll be talking about that today. That reason is because of the idea of the reciprocation that's involved with every one of the types of love I've just mentioned, and I've mentioned three of them. In order to get away from the idea of reciprocation in regard to love, something given in connection with something returned, self-interest, self-protection, self-preservation, self-promotion, self-advancement, self-aggrandizement, building me up, all that must be set aside for the sake of the one for whom that agape love is to be bestowed. All that personal I, 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 me, 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 it's about me, it's about me. That has to be set aside if it's going to be agape love. 
Uh, just the opposite is true. Agape love is self-sacrificial love. And when I say self, I don't mean giving up who you are, uh, giving up your identity. Uh, I mean giving up that ego related to self, the self-ego side of things. Um, it's self-sacrificial in that sense. It's the sacrifice of self. Uh, ego related for the sake of another person. Agape love has been defined as spiritual love by many commentators because agape love is action love uh, spent on behalf of another, uh, a decision to act to the, benefit, to the benefit of another, totally apart from the idea of any reciprocation uh, on the part of the one on whom that agape is being bestowed. In our previous lesson, we talked about how God is agape love. When it says God is love, it, the word's agape. It isn't phila o or eros or storgos. God is agape love. And that's who he is in the essence of his being. He doesn't, he doesn't have to live up to a standard, as we said in our previous lesson, outside of himself. There is no standard outside of himself, unlike us. If we were going to try to live up to a standard of agape love, we'd have to look at Christ. But God doesn't have to do that because God is that essence himself. He can't operate apart from who he is and is in the essence of his being. Uh, so uh, God's agape love. God cannot operate apart from who he is in the aspect of his love and the aspect of his justice. Agape love is a type of love that does not come naturally, I think that probably goes without saying, uh, to a man. Because self-interest and self-focus is the sin bent within all men. And we've inherited that sin bent uh, from rebellious Adam in the garden. So unlike God, we always will have that idea where naturally our tendency is to always slide into that you do for me, I'll do for you. And as long as we're both doing for one another, we're, we'll be fine. Um, therefore, self-interest self-focused, self-preserving, self-protecting, self-serving mindset is at the core, the very core of our being as, as humanity. Uh, because of that sin bent, we might call it uh, a sin bent because that's what it really is, a sin bent, bent toward serving self. And it's all of ours to own. It's every person's to own if you're human. Man is not the source of agape love, by the way. If you are performing agape love, you're not the source of that agape love. Um, agape love can only come from its source. It can't come outside its source. And man is not, nor can man ever be that source of agape love. God alone is the source of who he is, which is agape. Therefore, if we are to love as God loves, agape love, that must come from the indwelling Godhead in the individual. We'll show that in a little bit. How do we know that no man is capable of being the source of the agape love he might claim to practice uh, or actually be practicing for that matter? Christ made that very plain. Can you think of a verse? Now stay with me here and think of a verse where you could see that it's impossible for a, for a human being to be the source of agape love. There's a verse that's jumped out at me and I think it'll jump out at you. Christ made it very plain when Christ said, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. That's a statement, isn't it? Christ sacrificed himself for the sake of his enemies, Paul told us in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. So if a person is truly practicing God's love, God's agape, Who's really doing the bestowing of that love when a person's practicing that? From where, does God, from where does God's agape come? Paul provides the answer in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Hope maketh, let's see if I have it here. Hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. You see it? The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So it's the Holy Spirit inside us that is operating the agape love through us that belongs to Jesus Christ. Now how can God use a believer to exercise his agape love to other people? What makes us useful for God to be able to exercise agape uh, through us? Uh, well, that's what we're going to talk about today. The Apostle Paul tells us that agape love is the fruit 
of the of the Holy Spirit in his letter to the saints at Galatia. Therefore, agape love is a type of love that no man is capable of performing, much less producing, apart from the indwelling Holy Spirit who produces it. Because the motivation for agape is totally different. The only motivation that works for agape is what Christ agape on our behalf. So apart from that motivation, your motivation for loving is something other than agape. Don't make, don't mistake kindness or uh, philanthropic behavior, we might say, benevolence or humane treatment of others or animals or whatever. Don't ever mistake those types of love for agape love. There's a difference in those things in agape love, and we'll talk about the difference a little later on. Today's study is about that which stands in the way of the Holy Spirit being able to use us to perform agape on behalf of the others. There's a roadblock that stands in the way. And for the sake of simplicity, let's just call it ego-related pride. Ego and pride, same word maybe, but self-related pride. Uh, that stands in the way. Ego is agape's obstacle. And I'll try to show that today and we'll try to illustrate it in Scripture. Uh, what then is required for the Holy Spirit to produce agape in any believer's life for that matter? Let me put it another way. What is required for the Holy Spirit to use, to be able to use believers to express God's love through those believers. What does he require? The answer is the spiritual maturity of the believer. The answer is the spiritual maturity of the believer. Let's back, uh, let's back up a minute. Look back with me at Paul's statement about the three things or three doctrinal issues that remain on the table today as far as Paul's uh, listed them in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. You know this passage. And now abideth, here are the three things, faith, uh, hope, charity or agape, charity translated agape, charity be, being the idea of something given with nothing expected in return. These three, but the greatest of these is agape love. Uh, Paul calls agape love the greatest of the three uh, because the exercise of agape love is directly related to the spiritual maturity of the one expressing agape love. Um, the carnal saints at Corinth, for instance, were focused solely upon satisfying others or themselves themselves. They were so self-oriented, self-satisfying -sat the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. They were focused on self, focused on themselves rather than upon setting self aside in order to serve those with whom they were joined in the body of Christ. Paul called them babies. Paul called them, in a sense, infantile believers, um, baby gracers, as I called them a while back. And through that label, he was revealing the measure of their spiritual maturity. They were the exact opposite of agape. And so, why? They had no spiritual maturity. They needed to grow in who they were in Christ, who others are in Christ, and who all of us are outside of Christ. They weren't evaluating God properly. They weren't evaluating themselves properly or their fellow believers properly. Uh, they were looking only at self. In spite of their profuse giftedness, when you think back of how many gifts God gave those folks, there had been no spiritual growth at all in Corinth. I mean, they had the gifts, but they hadn't grown at all. Uh, what a good verse to, to use to think back to, we have this treasure in earth and vessels, so that the power might not be of us, but of God. Uh, so God does it through weak people. He does it through hurting people. He works through broken people. God works through people so that we might know ourselves. This is not us. Whatever good comes from us, it comes from God. Uh, we're not the producers of it. So, you know, we take pride sometimes. That's the self that we can't get away from. That's the self-bent that we all have. Um, so, according to Paul, the self-serving Corinthians had come behind in no gift, remember? Where they had been sorely lacking was in the area of agape love. Uh, let's quickly go back to Colossians chapter 3. We'll reread verses 5 through 15 to have that passage fresh in our minds because we're ready to hopefully graduate from uh, this final epistle to an assembly that Paul's writing to here. And this is the most important section of Scripture for us because this is the apex of spiritual maturity sitting in this section. This is what spiritual maturity of believers is all about here. Beginning with verse 5, Paul states, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 
For which thing's sake, the wrath of God is coming, as I write this letter, the verb tense, on the children of disobedience. We talked about how Paul's pointing back to the nation Israel and how scriptures are just rife with all these issues that, uh, of which uh, Israel had been guilty nationally. In the which ye also, now he's pointing back to the saints, in which you Colossians also walked for a time uh, when you lived in those things, when those things characterized your own lives. Fornication, where the nation Israel's concerned, had to do with their betrayal of their marriage agreement with God. Um, the inward attitude that led to that outward treacherous behavior, as the prophet said, you dealt treacherous, treacherously with me as a wife dealeth treacherously with her husband. Um, the inward attitude that led to that treacherous behavior, where their marriage partner was concerned, God the Father, was their idolatrous thinking. They had an idolatrous mindset. But it was interesting to see what Paul did next. Uh, instead of continuing on with the nation Israel's failure, he began in verse 8 by pointing at the failure of the saints in Colossae to show them they were no better than the nation Israel. They had the very thing inside them that led to Israel's betrayal of her marriage partner. And that very thing, when working through us, leads to our betrayal of those to whom we're joined as Paul worked his way up through blasphemy and filthy communication, which we'll look at in a moment. Uh, so Paul's letting the saints in Colossae know that there's, there was plenty of room <laughs> remaining when it came to their own spiritual growth. Notice verses 8 through 10. But now ye also, you Colossians, put off all these. And now he goes to that inner attitude, anger, which we described as being orge, the inner sense of resentment that goes on a person's mind when he compares himself to others and what they have and what he doesn't have and what good has happened to them didn't happen to to me and why did this person do that for that person and he didn't do that for me it's it's an idea of inner resentment that's sitting seething below the surface like lava uh, maybe sitting idly underneath a volcano but it's there nonetheless it doesn't go away it just seethes inside it's called orge uh, related to man that's how it works and then he goes to wrath a breathing hard type of anger. Now it's becoming, now it's really getting on my last nerve, what's inside me. Malice. Now that's bubbling up that lava, and now it's malice. Now it's a plan, inner plan, maybe conscious, maybe subconscious. I'm going to get even with that, pe that person. And we do it subconsciously and we do it consciously, but we do it. We get even in some sense of the of word. Blasphemy. Filthy communication. Put that out of your mouth, Paul says. Lie not to one another. The verb tense, stop lying. To one another seeing that you've already put off the old man with his deeds they did that when they became the new creation and you've already put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him when you look over the things Paul mentions in in this passage particularly in verses 5 through 9 covetousness which is idolatry evil concupiscence inordinate affection uncleanness think about let those words just Sit in your mind for a moment. Fornication, anger, orge, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, lying. It's hardly conceivable that Paul is addressing believers in this passage. I mean, does it strike you as odd? Paul's talking to saints, especially believers that he had addressed at the outside of this letter as being saints and faithful brethren in Christ. You mean put away these things and Paul's calling you a faithful brethren? Why? They listened to Paul. They were ready to do what Paul said. They were ready to look at themselves. You know, one of the major problems in that ego-related pride we're talking about, that self-interest, self-protection, self-preservation, is the ability to look at ourselves. So Paul circumvented the pride nature. He spoke the truth in love. He circumvented their pride nature so he could get them to really sit back and say, I'm going to see, oh, there I am. That's me. And so that's how Paul's dealing here. Obviously, they had been faithful in some areas. Paul called them faithful brethren. Whereas they, whereas they had huge rooms full of area to grow from a spiritual standpoint in other areas. Uh, some would say, how could this be, be? How could this lack of growth in Colossians be in light of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, where he stated, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. Old things are passed away. How many of you, how many of you have heard that? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In other words, no more agape anger, ever. No more inner resentments or that's not fair attitude ever again. 
uh, no more wrath, meaning indignation or malice in the sense of getting even, whether that be through, as I said, passive or active aggression. No more put downs when it comes to those with whom we disagree or dislike through gossip or the rumor mill. No more filthy communication in that respect ever again the moment you're saved. That's how some folks take that passage. No more little white lies or half-truths, as we like to call them, in order to apply a coat of whitewash over those things we don't really want to see as serious sins. Uh, none of that ever again. All of those things disappeared completely at the point of our salvation, at which point we never sinned again. That's how some folks would see that passage. I was in a conference some time ago now. It's probably been a couple years and a lady stood up in the front row. Her, her husband was a pastor of some strange sounding denomination. I don't even remember what it was. But she said, this is not true. What you're teaching is not true. Everybody looked at her and she said, I never sin. I said, you never, ever sin? I never sin. I cannot sin. And I said, do, do you ever do anything that's wrong? Well, you know, if I do, it goes away and I never do it again something to that effect. And I said, well, you know, you're not going to be happy with the remainder of the message. You're not happy with this first part. You're not going to be happy with the rest. So, you know, we'll, we'll take some time out for you to go ahead and walk out so you don't, you know, you don't have to sit through what you're not going to like. And she did. How often have you heard, though, <laughs> how often have you heard, though, someone use 2 Corinthians 5.17, old things were passed away, behold, all things are become new, in attempt to prove to you that a truly saved person does not sin. Uh, if any man be in Christ, they're quick to show us that person is a brand new creature. The verse says so. There it is. It's sitting there. And then just as quickly, they point out the fact that Paul didn't stop there. Paul went on to say, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Uh, I see a billboard every time I leave our, our home in, in uh, South Carolina. I see a billboard when we drive west on the interstate from where I live that reads, true Christians love their enemies. Now think about that. True Christians love their enemies. As the post to what, you might ask? Fake Christians? People who are really not Christians, after all, because their lack of agape love when it comes to their enemies? So these aren't really Christians? They're not really believers? What's the implication by that sinless salvation interpretation that's made on that billboard? The implication is twofold. First of, it's all, first of all, it's sin in anyone's life proves a lack of salvation. That's the implication number one. I can tell you who's saved and who is not saved if you just let me watch their behavior for a little time. And I can tell you if they're true believers or not. Uh, I had somebody that I know and love gone now years ago say if I don't see their works I have a big old question mark right here in the front of my head as to whether they're actually saved um, secondly and this is the the more subtle implication what does this tell us about the interpreter's view of himself well he's obviously he's obviously not including himself in any of the sins that Paul mentioned in Colossians is he um, of course not his sinning is gone he stopped sinning the moment he was saved this person's quick to spot the sins of others, but too busy judging the sins in others to spot the sins that have his own fingerprints on them. When Paul talks about the new creature, which can also be read new creation, and, th and that old things are passed away, all things are become new, he isn't talking about the cessation of sinning. He's talking about our previous identity as unbelievers in Adam number one. We were identified. We were associated with Adam number one. We were associated with what? Identified with sinful flesh. This has nothing to do with the judgment of those sins. This is our identification with sinful flesh. To die in association or identification with Adam number one and sinful flesh is to die in your sins, according to Scripture. Uh, to be in something is a place. It's a position, isn't it? It's a place. It's to be identified with something because in is a location. So to be in something is to be located in something, in a place. To be in your sins is to be identified or located in sinful Adam, in sinful flesh. Adam number one. So to be in sin, your sins is to be identified with sinful flesh. This is all about a person's identity where God is concerned. This has nothing at all to do with a continuation of or a cessation of sinning.
or with being judged for the sins that Christ has already judged for in our place at Calvary. This simply has to do with a person's identification with sinful flesh rather than with Christ's righteousness. It's one of the two. What an unbeliever needs then is not for someone to come along and die for his sins or to get God to take those sins off the table of his justice where that unbeliever is concerned. That was accomplished at Calvary where Christ became son on behalf of the entire human race as we all know. What every believer needs is what? A new identity. Every believer needs for God to see that, that unbeliever rather differently. Every unbeliever needs a new identity. Every unbeliever needs to be taken out of Adam number one uh, and his sinful flesh identification and to be located or placed into Adam number two, the perfectly sinless, perfectly righteous Christ. Uh, unbelievers simply need a change of identity. Um, that change of identity comes, according to the Apostle Paul, at the very point of a person's belief, a very point when, the very point when a person takes God at his word concerning what Christ accomplished where his sins are concerned, when Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again from the dead. When a person agrees with God that Christ put his sins away, when he took those sins and the judgment those sins deserved upon himself at Calvary, the Holy Spirit changes that person's spiritual location, his spiritual identity, by immediately taking that believer out of sinful Adam, number one, Adam number one, uh, that, that person's sinful flesh identity, and places that person into the perfectly righteous person of Jesus Christ. It's an identity. This, by the way, is the circumcision made without hands. Um, this is what Paul was talking about when he spoke of the circumcision made without hands in Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Let's read his words once again. And G-R, next word, complete, now notice it, in him. When you've got his identity on, uh, as your identity, how much more complete could you possibly be? How much more could God love anyone than he, God's, than he loves his beloved son? Uh, and so you're in him. You're joined to him as a part of him. How much does God love you? He loves you above everything else that, you, that I can think of. He, he loves those who are belong to him, which is Christ, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. So that who you were in Adam number one, your identity, cut away entirely from you. The body of the sins of the flesh taken away because of your new identity. Do you see it? From the point of our belief on, God no longer views us in our previous identification uh, with sinful flesh. But he, he now sees us only in our new identification as perfectly righteous son. So we're no longer from heaven's perspective who we once were. This has nothing to do with your behavior. It's identification. Uh, we are now the new creation that Paul was pointing out to the carnal saints in Corinth in the passage we just read. He was trying to get them to view themselves as God viewed them uh, so that they might live more closely related to who God had already made them to be by constantly pointing to who they are, who they are, who they are. Point to somebody and tell them who they aren't all the time. Point to a young person and keep ta telling them all the time who they aren't and how far short they come. And that young person will live to fulfill your greatest expectations because your expectations were never great to start with. But tell them who they are and build them up. Uh, make them see who, uh, ideally, how God sees them in Christ. And that young person has something then to, to live up to and achieve because the young person sees that picture of himself. I've often explained it, you know, uh, all of us, to some degree, all of us grew up looking at a picture we didn't even know we were seeing. But when we woke up and we ever we saw ourselves or thought of ourselves, we saw a picture in our, of our, in our minds of ourselves, someone else painted with their paint and their brush. And that painting is in our minds and we see ourselves in that light and we act accordingly. How do you change that for a young person? You, you have them start painting a new picture of themselves based on how God sees them in Christ. So they see that picture. They have an ideal then. Uh, do believers continue to sin? That's what a silly question, huh? Um, of course we do. Uh, were the carnal saints in Corinth still sinning when Paul wrote them and addressed them as saints? Certainly. Uh, if you don't believe so, go back and reread Paul's let two letters to those saints. As I've often said, it was one thing to be carnal and to be in Corinth. It was another thing to be carnal, to be in Corinth, and to be in Christ at the same time. Uh, 
rather than spend our earthly lives trying to manage our sins and who we were identified with those sins, Paul would rather we focus on our new identity in Christ. It's about a new way of thinking. Uh, we've called it in previous studies the doctrine of thinking. This is what walking not after the flesh but after the spirit is talking about. It's about the walk we have in our minds. It's a doctrine of walk, think walking, we might say it. It's about an acknowledgement of our new spiritual identity and living our lives with that new identity in mind. It's about seeing ourselves in that new identity rather than our previous identity. And the more spiritually mature we become, understanding who we're not and could never be apart from that new identity God's given us graciously, uh, the Holy Spirit's more able to use us to perform that agape outside of ourselves. As long as we're expecting a return, as long as we're expecting a reciprocated or reciprocal attitude even, uh, a reciprocal look, as long as we're expecting someone to give us something back for what we're giving them, that's not agape. That's not agape. That's something else. Uh, at no time did our Apostle Paul ever speak of believers gaining sinless perfection from a behavioral standpoint, uh, much less at the point of belief or any time in that, while in these mortal bodies. The new creation resides in the old earthly tent. So while we are the new man, the new man is battling against the sin nature within the earthly tent all the time. Uh, why then do some like to interpret 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 as being a reference to a cessation of sinning? Uh, well, this is a perfect example of what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, where he sounded this alarm. For I say through the grace un uh, uh, given unto me to... Notice it, every man that is among you. He didn't leave some out. Say, oh, well, you've, you've reached a, a point now where you can forget all about this. I say to every man that is among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of, or faith's standard, the standard that works with faith. A person who believes that the sin in others points to a lack of salvation is overlooking the sin in himself. It's as simple as that. Uh, that individual is thinking more highly of himself than he ought. Uh, but that shouldn't surprise us. Um, in that that tendency of the sin nature is to judge others more harshly than we judge ourselves. From what we've learned thus far in our journey through the Bible, that has been the course of this present evil world, as Paul calls it, from the time of the rebellion of Lucifer, back when he was the covering cherub, that had, anointed cherub that covered the throne room of God. Uh, Lucifer thought more highly of himself than he ought. He, become, he became caught up with self, as displayed in his five, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And the, the culminated in, I will be just like the most high God. Um, wow. This is what Paul was telling us here in Colossians in regard to man's agape love, where the creator is concerned. Here it is again, as we read Colossians 1, verse 18. And he, Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church, not a church, not a different church, not another church, but the one and only church, the one and only household of faith that includes all believers of all dispensations that God had predetermined and joined to the person of his son, uh, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he, the Lord Jesus Christ, might have the preeminence. So if you don't give the Lord Jesus Christ the preeminence in all things, your love for the Lord Jesus Christ is agape. It might be loving him. Have you read the scripture where it says no man seeks after God? We say, well, wait a minute. I was seeking after God when I was young. I really wanted to find God. No man is seeking after God. In what respect is that passage true? How many men are seeking after God in the agape love sense. I'm seeking after him just because I want to know who spoke the universe into existence. I'm, speak, I'm seeking after him just because I want to know more about who is, who is this God? Who is he? Who is this wonderful creator? God spoke the universe into existence with a breath. Who is this? Are we seeking God in that respect? Are most people seeking God with something even in the recesses of their motivations? What this God can do for me what I might gain from this God. I need to seek him because I need to benefit from him. And maybe he can get me the bigger house or the, or the 
better boat or whatever, you, you name it, you fill in the blank. We seek God for what God can do for us and give us. And naturally, we're lower than the Creator. But that's not agape. And so no man seeks after God agape-wise. The word translated preeminence there means first place. That's pretty easy, isn't it? That all things he might have first place. Lucifer's pride in wanting the position of first place brought the distance that became that came between the two, between, between the one who had been the anointed cherub covering the throne room of God and God himself. That distance had been an ego-related distance. Um, and that ego had belonged to Lucifer. Lucifer had simply been thinking more highly of himself than he ought. He thought he deserved something that was not his. So what did he do? He introduced that thinking more highly of himself idea into the mind of Eve. And of course Adam willingly followed along. And Adam and Eve sought distance from God, didn't they? You see how that, that initial thinking more highly of himself resulted in distance? It always does. So what did Adam and Eve do? They ran to seek God or to hide from him. They sought distance. They, they're the ones responsible for the distance. They sought to, he sought them out. They never sought him out. They sought distance. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, a verse you can look up on your own, says, uh, maybe it's here. And they heard, there it is, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve, Adam and his wife Eve, ran to find God and seek him out and apologize for what they'd done and say how wrong they were. No. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Idolatrous mindset. Distance. Keep that in mind. It was that thinking more highly of themselves than they ought idea that Lucifer had instilled in their minds that had brought about the distance that had come as a result of that idolatrous thinking. Of course, the nations that had come from those first parents in the garden thought more highly of themselves than they ought. Did, did they not? And we go right to the Gentiles after Adam and Eve. They came from the Adam and Eve's loins. Um, and that brought a distance from the Gentiles and God. God turned away from the Gentiles. But the Gentiles had brought about that distance themselves. They didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. They want to distance themselves from God before God ever did anything where the Gentiles were concerned. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. They didn't want to retain him in their thoughts, Paul says. They distanced themselves from God and God responded. They didn't want to glorify him for who he truly is. Ego-related distance all over again. God then formed a single nation, not from among those nations, through the call of Abram, as we all well know, uh, the nation Israel. Did that nation honor God for who he truly is as the most supreme high God? Give him the preeminence in their thinking that he deserves? Put simply, did they prefer God above themselves? What's agape all about? Did they prefer God above themselves? I believe you already know the answer. That answer in a nutshell is no. <laughs> Simple as that. And thus the ego-related distance that came as a result of the nations thinking more highly of themselves than they ought. When you have ego, self-preservation, self-protection, self-elevation, you're going to end up with distance. And it happens in assemblies all the time. They became vain in their imaginations, Paul tells us. And if you look up that word translated vain in a dictionary of the Greek, you'll find it's defined by the word idolatrous. Is that not, is that not good? They became idolatry, idolatrous minded. <laughs> they were idolatrous when it came to the idols they were worshiping. But their idol worship was simply the outgrowth that had sprung from the idolatrous mindset seed that they had inherited from the first parents in the garden thinking more highly of themselves than they ought. They had been think, thinking more highly of themselves than they ought from the get-go, we might say, and because the idolatrous mindset, the pride nature of man, the self-protectionism, protectionism, the want something for ourselves, how, what can we gain from this? It's the bane of all humankind. It's not agape. Their refusal to give God the preeminent position simply because of who God is was the proof of the elevated position in their minds they were giving themselves.
Uh, the Israelites were sitting on the throne of their own lives, is the way I've often expressed it, and ego-related distance came as a result. I probably needn't go any further. You know, know where I'm taking this, don't you? We began with Lucifer. We went to Adam and Eve. We went to the Gentiles. We went to Israel. When the Apostle Paul revealed the details of the new economy, the new dispensation called the dispensation or economy of the grace of God, the economy now in place, did the carnal Corinthian saints not think more highly of themselves than they ought? Uh, do you remember Paul? what Paul told them? Here it is as a reminder, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. For ye are yet carnal. Look that word up. Fleshly oriented, fleshly centered, fleshly minded, self-centered, self-sitting on the throne of each of those saints' lives. For whereas there is among you envying, how can I tell that? There's distance. How do I know what's sitting at the root? There's distance in the plant. Here it is. There's envying and strife and, next word, divisions. Do you see the different factions, sex, ego-related, S-E-C-T-S, <laughs> for those of you who are wondering about my pronunciation. Ego-related distance. Are ye not fleshly oriented and walk as men? How did Paul caution the saints in Rome? Um, once again, he addressed his admonition to every saint in that assembly. He didn't leave one out. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. We're told that's just the opposite today, are we not? In the world's wisdom, we're told we're not thinking highly enough of ourselves. We need to elevate ourselves a little bit more in our minds. When Paul's saying that's not the result, the problem is we think too highly of ourselves and we're requiring something of others they cannot give. Only God can give it. Where's our trust? What would be the result of ignoring that admonition from Paul? The result was that Paul had already been fully aware of what had already happened in Corinth, in that assembly, to whom he'd already written, divisions, eager related distance, self sitting on the throne of each believer's life, a refusal to give anyone else but self the preeminent place, the first place, by preferring others above self. Paul knew that, what had happened in Corinth. Now he's warning the saints in Rome. Because what do you, do you suppose Paul would say to me today? And to you, put, put us all in there. Did we not each inherit that which Lucifer instilled in the minds of Adam and Eve? And that which had been found in the minds of the Gentile nations and the nation Israel and the saints in Corinth and the believers in Rome? Do you think Paul would stand here and say, you folks have no need to worry about thinking more highly of yourselves as you ought. In fact, I want to reverse course now and tell you folks to think more highly of yourselves than you ought. Or would you say, don't think more highly of yourselves as, than you ought. Well, you're likely to, in your inner mind, demand something from someone else that only God can provide for you. You better trust God and not the other individual. Now you're free. You're free to express that same type of non-reciprocal type of love, agape love, outward to other folks. The pride nature of man is such that man will always have the tendency to think more highly of himself than he ought, to put himself in first place in his thinking, to consider himself prior to considering others. As I expressed it earlier, everything we see, everything we hear, is filtered through that sieve of self. And as a result, that colors to one degree or another everything we say and everything we do. Because self is related somewhere. We relate everything to that which we perceive might benefit or to that which we perceive might harm in some, some manner, self. We need to understand that a self-bent mindset is indeed a part of every believer's life. Paul commended the saints in Colossae. And now he's going to the very mindset that he knew to be the bane of humanity. Paul was writing to the saints in Corinth just as he was speaking to the saints in Rome. To whom was he writing in that Colossian epistle? Well, the answer is to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. Were those saints not already in Christ? Well, of course they were. Paul told them that. They'd already been um, changed in their identity and t taken on the new man identity. Um, speaking to those saved and sealed saints, Paul says... But now ye also, you faithful brethren, you saved and sealed saints, you faithful believers, put off these things. Put off anger, wrath, 
malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another. Stop lying to each other. Seeing that you've already put off the old man with his deeds. You've got that new identity already. The verb tense in this passage is aorist imperative middle. This tells us that at the time Paul wrote this letter, these things were indeed present in these believers' lives. The idea here is begin this very moment to put off what's not been put off up to this point, up to this point in time. Reason it through for a moment. Would Paul have had to tell these faithful saints in Colossae, these faithful brethren in Christ, to put off the particular things he's telling them to put off if these things were no longer uh, uh, characteristic, uh, characterizing their lives in Colossae? Why would he tell them to put off things he knew weren't even present in Colossae? That doesn't make any sense, does it? If all these things had disappeared at the point of their salvation, when all things became new for these folks, there would have been no need for Paul to write verses 5 through 9, would there? If these sinful attitudes and actions had disappeared altogether, let's say a day after, a month after, even a year after they had believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then the Apostle Paul could have left out the practical application section of every epistle he wrote to every assembly to which he wrote. We'd see no exhortation from Paul's pen in the Bible. We'd see no correction. We'd see no admonition for the saints. Uh, we'd see no rebuke. We'd see no condemnation from the Apostle Paul where any believer is concerned. Sinning would be remarkably absent in saints. But is that true? <laughs> I think you know the opposite, don't you? The fact is Paul's letters are directed to and written for the direct benefit of believers. This tells us that evil concupiscence, ordinate affection, uncleanness, fornication, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, lying to one another may rear their ugly heads at any given time. In fact, they're ready to rear their ugly heads at all times. And yes, even when it comes to believers. These things were very obvious in the lives of the saints at Corinth. And they're apt to become obvious in the life of any believer at any time. That's who we really are apart from our new identity. Thank God that he didn't expect us to earn a new identity before we became that new identity. He placed us and gave us that new identity while we still have this old sin bent residing in us and working inside us all the time. Why are those things apt to become a part of our lives? Because they all stem from covetousness, which is idolatry, and the idolatrous mindset is the sin nature of man. Given a sufficient amount of time, given the proper circumstances, and every one of us are capable of doing that which is unimaginable at the moment. Um, and even when we're not doing those unimaginable things, evil's ever present with us, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7, verse 21. Evil is ever present with the, was ever present with the Apostle Paul, if you read that passage. He states that. This is why Paul placed no confidence in his flesh, Philippians 3.3. 3. I'm just naming some, some addresses. You can look them up on your own. You see, take away, take away, remove man's fleshly tendency to have self sitting on the throne of his life. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, lying to him. Those things disappear. Take away man's bent towards serving self, first and foremost. And divisions and factions would be gone. There wouldn't be any more. Take away idolatrous born covetousness. And as I said some years ago, war would be no more. While that may be the enthusiasm of ignorance, as one pastor called it, may be the idealism of the college age crowd, at least of my day in the 60s, scripture tells us that will not happen this side of the rule and reign of Jesus Christ upon planet earth. The sin nature is ever present within each of us and the Apostle Paul uh, was it present in the Apostle Paul and he's telling us that idolatrous mindset is ours to own. We better see who we are with the sin nature residing in the in the new creation. The sin nature residing in the old tent that the new creation resides in as the war, the battle took place between Paul and his sin nature all the time. How much confidence did Paul put in his flesh to be able to conquer that? To stop this, stop that, start doing the other. Well, you, if you put this away, now if you go back to the law and the law says do this, don't do that, do that and you'll beat that sin nature. 
made sin, made Paul the more sinful, he said. He was focusing on his sin. What was he not focusing on? Agape. He wasn't giving a thought to agape. He was giving a thought to stop doing this, start doing that. Uh, you see, while the sin nature, self sitting on the throne of each of our lives, is always present with us, we do not have to allow it to rule and reign in our lives, Paul's telling us. And we don't have to allow it to fracture others who happen across our paths or who come into our lives. Now, before our apostle tells us how to render the sin bent within us, functionally inoperative, not inoperative, don't give it ruler reignship here, let's take a few moments to examine the four stages of idolatrous thinking. Because it works in stages. I want to show you how it works. I spoke about these things some time ago. We need to revisit them, review them a bit in this study of Colossians where Paul's correcting the thinking of saints in regard to agape love. If you've been following our studies throughout the years, you may recall some of these things. We had broken it down into four simple parts. We called them the four stages of idolatrous thinking. The sin nature's pathway to separation is a way you might think of it. Because that's really what it is. If we trace it all the way back to Lucifer, we find the following order of events. It began with Lucifer's conceit, did it not? Lucifer had been caught up with the brightness of his own beauty, according to Ezekiel 28:17. You might think, or you might want to look up these passages again on your own. Conceit then quickly became covetousness, as Lucifer had thought himself to be worthy of and desired to be just like the Most High God. It started with conceit. It moved to covetousness. I want what belongs to him. In his covetousness, Lucifer formulated, Lucifer formulated a plan for control. His plan of evil, as it's been called in history, culminating in his five I wills. Now he's put that plan. This is the malice. Started with orge, went to uh, wrath, that uh, 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 thumos, breathing hard type of indignation. Now Lucifer's got his plan here. Uh, malice. He's going to put that plan, I'm going to be just like the Most High God. You can see that expressed by Isaiah in chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. You recall Lucifer's presumptuous challenge? I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be just like the Most High God. This, as we all know, is what brought the distance that came between Lucifer and God. You say, God brought that distance. No, Lucifer did. Lucifer had chosen the pathway to separation because Lucifer had been thinking more highly of himself than he ought to think. Lucifer's idolatrous mindset, his idolatrous thinking, had been the very thing that brought the distance about. If you go back in Scripture, you can witness each of these four stages of uh, idolatry, idolatrous thinking with Lucifer, and you go watch it take shape. Those four stages of idolatrous thinking played out all over again when it came to the Gentiles prior to the establishment of the nation Israel. The Gentiles desired to make a what for themselves? Four letters, starts with the letter N. Name. We want to make a name for ourselves. Is that not idolatrous thinking? Is that not thinking more highly of themselves than they ought? We're going to make a name for ourselves. Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, they said, Let us make us a name. They were basking in their own glory, seeking a place of preeminence they had supposed that they deserved. Their attempt at control came in their building project called the Tower of Babel. <laughs> and once again, separation came as a result. Same four stages of idolatrous thinking played themselves out when it came to the nation Israel that God had given, uh, after God had given the Gentiles over to their unapproved thinking, their idolatrous thinking, and had begun dealing with that single nation. There's an abundance of evidence in Scripture. We've looked at many of the prophets, statements of the prophets regarding the nation's idolatry, their idolatrous mindset. Had they been thinking more highly of themselves than they ought? Let's allow the prophet Ezekiel to tell us about that as we read his words in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 15. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty and plantest the harlot because of thy renown and pourest out thy fornications on everyone that passed by his it was. They hadn't been considering the Most High God. They'd been thinking only of self, themselves. God had told them to destroy the people groups in the promised land when they entered that land because God had foreknown those people groups had turned their hearts away from him to the worship of gods that were no gods at all. 
when it came to doing what God told them to do, did they give him the preeminence? Did they prefer him over what they were thinking, over what their flesh would tell them? Did they do what God said, or did they do what their minds told them they ought to do? They disobeyed. They didn't put God first. They put themselves first. They were, they were thinking, they were supposing that they were doing what would be in their own best interest. But God knew what would be in their own best interest. So they followed the course of their human reasoning in protecting themselves and not following God. And it brought distance. Rather than preferring God, the Israelites were taking matters into their own hands, as we discovered in our earlier studies. They would control their own destiny. We could say it that way. Rather than giving the Most High God the place of preeminence He rightly deserves and listening to Him, following Him. By placing themselves above God in their own minds, the nation, not God, but the nation, had been responsible for bringing about the distance from God that had come as a result of allowing their idolatrous thinking to run its course. God hadn't been responsible for the nation Israel's behavior, nor had he been responsible for the distance that had ultimately come between him and the nation Israel. Uh, they would have to own that for themselves. They had been responsible. They had brought that distance about. You see why I said that idolatrous thinking brings about separation, it brings about distance. It all began with Lucifer's focus on self, man's sin nature ever since, that self-focus idea was playing the minds of the first parents. It's been the same way, self first and foremost in my life and in yours throughout our existence here in these earthly tents. This is the fleshly nature of mankind, fallen man. And it's the, price, the precise reason for Paul's warning uh, when it came to agape love, the agape love chapter of Romans, Romans chapter 12. Don't think more highly of yourselves, Paul said, than you ought to think. Interestingly enough, faith standard takes us in the precise opposite direction of thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought. Than we ought. Paul went on to talk about agape without hypocrisy in Romans chapter 12 and about being kindly affection, affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Giving another first place? Think about that. Paul knew something about us, didn't he? The Holy Spirit knew something about us. And the Holy Spirit wanted Paul to tell us that something about us. The Holy Spirit knew something about Lucifer. He knew something about Adam and Eve. He knew something about the Gentiles. He knew something about the Israel. And he knows something about you and about me. And that's that we all have the tendency to put ourselves above somebody else. In fact, we put ourselves above everything else. Protect, self-preserve preserve, uh, elevate self. Christ was willing to give up self for the sake of his enemies. He was willing to step down off the throne that he so rightly deserved in order to do something else. And what was it? To glorify who? To glorify us, his enemies. Self, Christ willingly gave up his own rights his own self. He didn't protect himself. He didn't defend himself. He stepped down off the throne in a manner of speaking so that he could put you and me on that throne. Wow. That's agape. That's agape. How willing are each of us here today and those listening? How willing are any of us to step down off the throne, cease telling what people what they ought to do and how they ought to do it. Look at ourselves correctly and see apart from my new identity that God gave me graciously, I'm a zero. And so are you. We're all zeros. But all of my protection, all of my needs, all of my unconditional love, all of my unconditional forgiveness, all of my unconditional acceptance comes only from God. Who's already given it? Now what's that do for me? It frees me up to stop seeking acceptance from you. It frees me up to stop seeking your forgiveness or your acceptance um, and your love. I don't have to seek love from you or forgiveness or acceptance. If I am, maybe I'll become a yes man. Maybe I'll become a tyrant. But I don't have to seek any of that from you. Why not? Because I've already got it from God. I've got it from the one who is preeminent. What's that free me up to do? That frees me up to take myself off the throne of my life now and let God be those things that he was for me to you through me.
It allows God to work through me to love you in spite of what you do, in spite of what you say, in spite of who you are, in spite of the danger you might present. It allows me to love you in spite of anything about you because it's God loving you through me in the fact that he's already satisfied all those things for me if I'll merely trust him to have done it. And that's what spiritual growth, that's what spiritual maturity is all about. That's why Paul's ending this Colossian epistle with things to put off and things to put on. And above all these things, he tells us a whole list of things. Put off this, put off that, put off the other. He goes on through a whole list of put-offs. And then he says, and above all these things. Not, not in addition to these things, but even furthermore, even something that supersedes all these things you're to do. Put on agape. Put on agape. How do I do that? How do I do that? By recognizing who I am outside of Christ, which is lesson zero. By recognizing who I am in Christ and what I have in Christ is everything as complete as I could ever be. Perfect. The perfect man in that regard. I don't need you to be that for me. I don't need my wife to be that for me or my children to be that for me. I don't need to be appearance related. I don't need to be, be yes person related. I've got it all from God. And so do you. So now each of us here is free. We're all free. This is what liberty is about. We're all free to agape others, to allow God to agape them through us as we stop looking for what they have, what we have to benefit from them, what we might stand to lose or be harmed by them. We can forget all that. Just love them. Love them as Christ loved them and Christ loved them while they were yet and while I was yet his enemy. You can love those you like the least. That's the apex of spiritual maturity. And the Apostle Paul and God call it agape love. Thank you for joining with us in your endeavor to discover the truths in God's Word. Pastor and teacher Kirk Christ and the entire fellowship of Welcome to Grace Ministries would like to thank you for your support of this ministry of grace. If you're enjoying the teachings and want to share with others, please write us at Welcome to Grace Ministries, P.O. Box 90, Penrose, North Carolina, 28766. You may call us toll free at 877-770-7098 or visit us on the web at www welcome to grace.com. Again, thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you.